Hello, this is Miss Clark. I will be reading Arthur Ashe Schwembert, and this is located at ASCD.org. Read this essay that eulogizes Arthur Ashe, the tennis champion who died in 1993, and then answer the questions that follow. So you will be using this text with other Arthur Ashe texts to answer a question on Arthur Ashe's characteristics. So when we talk about the word eulogy, what we're really saying here is that this particular person has died and the eulogy is a way to honor the life that this person lived. Arthur Ashe Remembered, John McPhee, originally published in The New Yorker, March 1993. He once described his life as a succession of fortunate circumstances. He was in his 20s then. More than half of his life was behind him. His memory of his mother was confined to a single image. In a blue corduroy bathrobe, she stood in a doorway looking out on the courts and playing fields surrounding their house, which stood in the center of a Richmond playground. Weakened by illness, she was taken to a hospital that day and died at the age of 27. He, meaning Arthur Ashe, was six. It was to be his tragedy, as the world knows, that he would leave his own child when she was six. His life would be trapped in a medical irony as a result of early heart disease, and death would come to him prematurely, as it had to his mother. His mother was tall, with long, soft hair, and a face that was gentle and thin. She read a lot. She read a lot to him. His father said of her, she was just like Arthur Jr. She never argued. She was quiet, easygoing, kind-hearted. So one main idea that we have here is that Arthur and his mother have similarities. So one similarity is that they died very early in their life. She was 27, Mrs. Ash, and she died when her son was six. And paragraph two tells us that he would also die very young, prematurely, very young, and his child would also be six. We also are told that they have similar personality traits, quiet, easygoing, kind-hearted. If by legacy her son never argued, he was also schooled, instructed, coached not to argue. And as he moved alone into alien country, he fashioned not arguing into an enigma and turned the enigma into a weapon. So when we talk about someone having a legacy, this word here, we talk about somebody that has left legendary qualities, legendary events that they were part of and even formed. They have left these as a mark on history, and perhaps some of their achievements are original and specific just to them and their chosen profession. So original and specific to Arthur Ashe and his profession, being a tennis champion, is that he never argued. So imagine this athlete winning or losing or having a 
challenging moment on the court and he just didn't fight. He didn't exchange negative words with his competitor. And he was schooled in the art of not arguing. He was instructed. He was, in, he was coached in how to get through life without having a fight, be it verbal or physical. And it says he moved into alien country. Now, this is an analogy. So Arthur Ashe was an African-American tennis player, which was very unique because when Arthur Ashe's career as a tennis player was formulated, there were not any other black tennis players that he could emulate or copy his life after. So it was though he was an alien or a foreigner in the country of professional tennis. So this is an analogy, alien country, meaning that professional tennis was unique. He broke into that world. And what did he bring in breaking into that world? A player, an athlete who was calm, even in the most competitive moments. And he used that calmness as a weapon on the court. So not a literal weapon like a gun or a knife or a slingshot, a weapon in which to keep his competition on the court, wondering what he was thinking, wondering what his next move might be on the court. When things got tough, as I noted in these pages 24 years ago, so our author, John McPhee, is telling us that when he wrote in The New Yorker in 1993, this eulogy, This piece, uh, eulogizing, memorializing Arthur Ashe's life, he's telling us that 24 years ago, he also wrote about Arthur Ashe's composure on the court. When things got tough, as I noted in these pages 24 years ago, he had control. In very tight moments, other players thought he was toying with them. They really knew what he was thinking. They could not tell if he was angry. Oh, it was maddening sometimes to play against him. Never less than candid, never less than honest. Arthur Ashe was always honest, nothing less than honest. He said that what he liked best about himself on a tennis court was his demeanor. Now, demeanor means the personality, the the presence on the court, the way he looked when he walked out. Now, let's see in his words what he liked about himself in his own words. See, the colon right here tells us this is a quote from his own words. What it is is controlled, cool, in a way. Always have the situation under control, even if losing. Never betray betray an inward sense of defeat. So what Arthur Ashe told people, reporters, about the quality he loved the best about himself was his controlled cool. That even if he was losing a tennis match, he was true to himself. That even if he felt defeated, he wouldn't let that get to him. He wouldn't let that aggravate him. So if we can relate to that for a moment before we go on to paragraph five, which is our last paragraph of the eulogy, if we can relate to that for a moment and we think about the, our own specialty, the thing we ourselves are quite good at. 
I'm quite good at reading aloud. And if there's a lot of noise in the room, if there is um, something that is happening with my day, maybe I'm especially tired, I got to bed late, I have a lot of grading to do, and that's creating stress for me, maybe that will make my reading not so good, not so controlled, not so pleasant to hear. But what Arthur Ashe is telling us in his own words is that it didn't matter what was going on inside my head. I never betrayed myself into feeling defeated. I knew that I could win. So think of for a moment the thing that you're really good at. Do you ever get aggravated if you are feeling defeated? If you are feeling as though you might not win, think about a game of checkers. Do you let the stress show on your face? If you were Arthur Ashe, you wouldn't. And of course, he never did. Not in the height of his athletic power, not in the statesmanship of the years that followed, not in the end game of his existence. If you wish to choose a single image, you would see him standing there in his 20s, his lithe, his thin body, a braid of cables, his energy without apparent limit, in a court situation indescribably bad, and all he does is put his index finger on the bridge of his glasses and push them back up the bridge of his nose. In the shadow of disaster, he hits out, faced with a choice between a conservative percentage return or a 1 in 10 flat-out blast he chooses the blast. So <clears throat> the first time I read this, I was not sure on what these phrases were. A conservative percentage return or one in tap, 10 flat out blast. These are tennis moves. So, you know, there's, there's, there's phrases that are specific to sports. You know, I'm thinking to think about bowling for a moment. There's a strike. There's a spare. When you get a strike, all 10 pins come down. When you get a spare, half the pins go down. These up, up, these level you up in, in, in score. So to get better scores, Arthur Ashe would choose the blast. In a signature manner, he extends his left arm to point upward at lobs as they fall toward him. His overheads in fire bursts put them away. His backhand is, if anything, stronger than his forehand, and his shots from either side, for the most part, are explosions. Just a great metaphor right here. His shots, whether they are coming from the left or the right, are explosions. <laughs> Just see that on the court. In motions graceful and decisive, though, and with reactions as fast as the imagination, he is a master of drop shots, of cat and mouse, of miscellaneous dinks and chips, and, riskiest of all, the cross-court half volley. Now, again, these are tennis moves. You could Google them. You could look them up. You could watch a quick, quick match of tennis. You could Google Arthur Ashe playing tennis and watch him make the dinks and the chips and the riskiest of all, the cross-court half volley. And these are, according to this writer, his signature moves. I'm just looking for that phrase. He is a master of these in a signature manner. Signature, his meaning he, he has his name written on these moves. That's how good he is. Other tennis players might be wondering who in his right mind would attempt something like that. But that is how Ash plays the game. Colon. So we're going to see in this last couple sentences, how does Ash play the game? 
At the tensest moment, he goes for the all but impossible. At the most stressful moment in the tennis match, he goes for the thing that is the hardest to do. He is predictably unpredictable. He is unreadable. This comes back to the idea that he doesn't look upset. He doesn't look worried. He doesn't look angry. He's just unreasonable, unreadable, unreadable. He can't, as, as his competitor, you would be thinking, my goodness, is he stressed out right now? You know, it's it's 28 to, to, to 27. Is he stressed out? But you can't read him. That's how he was schooled. He was coached. He was instructed in this calm demeanor. His ballistic serves move in odd patterns and come off the court in unexpected ways. Behind his impassive face, Behind the enigmatic glasses, the lifted chin, the first mate on the bridge look, there seems to be, even from this distance, a smile. So if this is a eulogy, which it is, by the very end of these five paragraphs, John McPhee wants us to remember not only these amazing tennis moves that Arthur Ashe had put his signature on, but he also had a very beautiful smile. He had this first mate on the bridge look about him. He just really had this knowledgeable confidence. And you couldn't help but just love his smile according to John McPhee. And if we go all the way back up into the top where that first sentence is, Arthur Ashe once described his life as a succession of fortunate circumstances. It is a little ironic that this man died so young, yet he considered his life so fortunate, so blessed. Thank you for letting me read to you, and I look forward to reading to you again. Have a very nice day.